it looks ridiculously simple. It's just two wooden fences and a plywood base, but this specific cross-cut sled design has hidden capabilities. One of its best features is dial-in accuracy. You can get the back fence perfectly square to the blade simply by loosening a few nuts. And that's just the beginning. As you're about to find out, this simple looking sled is one of the most versatile and capable tools that you can make. Ow. Travis and I typically use two cross-cut sleds for our woodworking operations. One with a single fence and one with two fences, plus a miter gauge. Now, there is a lot of overlap between these three tools. They all take long boards and turn them into short boards. But for specific operations, often one of them outshines the other. And for ordinary, run-of-the-mill cross-cut operations, that is, taking a board and cutting an end square to an edge, the double-sided cross-cut sled outshines the others for simplicity and accuracy. As you can see on this stripped-down version, there are just a few parts. The sled base, two guides, and two fences. The base supports the work on both sides of the blade so that the keeper and the cutoff remain parallel to the table all during the cutting operation. The back fence keeps the wood square to the blade. Both fences keep the base flat and rigid. The double guides reduce slop in the system and keep the sled traveling straight and true. This sled has two unique features that help improve its accuracy. First of all, the back fence is not glued to the base. Instead, it's bolted, and the bolt holes are enlarged so that I can shift this a little to the left or a little to the right and get it perfectly square to the blade. Additionally, sawdust is less of a concern. On most sleds, you must clean out the sawdust after each cut so the board will rest flush against the fence. The back fence on this sled is raised just a smidge above the base so that sawdust is less likely to affect the cut. The one and only drawback is a safety concern. Because of the two fences, this sled does not play nicely with the saw guards that come with most saws. So I'll be showing you how we can add guards to the sled itself to help keep the blade from molesting your fingers. And I'll be showing you other features that we can add to increase the capabilities of this truly outstanding tool. But before we get busy, a quick reminder. This video is sponsored by us. Detailed plans in digital PDF format for this sled and all its features are available from our store in both Imperial and metric measurements. And we offer plans for other jigs. There are whole books full of jigs that I have written just waiting for you to wake up and smell the sawdust. To support our channel, please like, subscribe, and visit the Workshop Companion General Store. Now, let's get busy. To make the sled, let's start by attaching the base to the guides. Now, I made the base from Baltic birch plywood but you can use anything that will remain flat and true for a long period of time. MDF and melamine are both good choices. It should be thick enough to be reasonably rigid, but not so thick as to be uncomfortably heavy. I usually make my sled bases one half inch or 13 millimeters thick. I'm making the guide bars from UHMW. It stands for ultra high molecular weight. It's a type of polyethylene plastic. The stuff is easy to cut and drill. It's also very slippery and it wears like iron. However, you can also use a hardwood like maple or birch or salvaged metal guide bars from old miter gauges. You can also use metal T-tracks. These are the same size as most miter gauge slots. The trick is to get both guides positioned perfectly so that the sled slides easily with no side to side slop. Now, there are about a bazillion ways to do this, and most of them include a great deal of very careful measuring, a good deal of nail biting, and stresses beyond what most mortals can endure. I'm going to show you a technique that requires almost no measuring 
and only a teeny tiny bit of nail biting. Because I'm using plastic guides, I'm going to mount them in shallow dados. This will help keep them straight and true. This is also a good idea with wood bars. They bend a little too. It's not necessary with metal bars, of course, but the technique will remain the same, minus the dados. Cut the dado for the right guide bar just a short distance from the right edge of the sled. Don't cut the left dado yet. Attach one guide in the dado. You can glue or screw these in place depending on what you've made them from, but I'm going to use a flathead machine screw for the simple reason that you can use these to adjust the guides and remove any slop. You just tighten the screw and the flathead acts like a wedge that spreads the plastic ever so slightly. Drill and countersink holes for the screw heads in the bottom faces of the bars. Then use the bars as a guide to mark the mounting holes in the sled with a transfer punch. Drill small holes through the base to transfer the hole locations to the other side. Then turn the base over. Make counterbores in the base to hold the nuts and washers. Then drill the screw holes through the base. While you're set up on the drill press, make both guide bars, even though we're going to mount just one. Bolt the bar in the dado and snug up the machine screws. Not too tight. We don't want the plastic to expand yet. Take the second guide bar and attach double-sided carpet tape to the top surface. Place some washers in the left miter gauge slot, enough to hold the guide bar proud of the table. Lay the guide bar on the washers. Holding the left side of the sled just above the table, put the right guide bar in the right miter gauge slot. Lower the left side of the sled until it contacts the left bar and press down hard to activate the adhesive. You may want to whack it with a dead blow hammer. The guide bar is now stuck to the sled precisely where we want it. I'm going to mark its position on the sled and then remove it. I can use these marks to set up to make the second dado. But first, I'm going to cut something else that down the road may save us some weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to cut a test dado in a scrap of plywood. I cut the first dado, the right hand dado, in the same scrap when I was set up to do it. Now I'm using this scrap to check the setup for the second dado, the left hand dado. And when I'm sure I've got it just right, I'll cut that dado in the sled. Actually, I made several of these test pieces, which I dadoed top and bottom. You see, sometimes it takes a few tries to get this set up perfect. But there was no weeping and barely any gnashing. Mount the second bar to the sled exactly the same way you mounted the first. Then test fit the sled in the miter slots. If the fit is too loose, tighten the machine screws to spread the bars. If the fit is too tight, use a scraper to carefully shave away a little stock from the guides. As the fit gets looser, it will be harder to tell where to scrape. Draw lines with a marker down the sides of the guides. Then put the sled in the miter gauge slots and slide it back and forth a few times. Check the marks. Where the mark is rubbed off the guide, that's where you need to scrape some more. Make the fences from a hard, stable wood. I prefer ash for most of my jig projects, but you can also use maple, birch, poplar, oak. All of those are good choices. Get straight grain, say as straight as you can find. You can make the fences more stable by book matching the grain. Cut the board twice as long as you need, but only half as thick. Then cut the board in two and fold it together at the ends. Any imperfections in the wood will be mirrored on both sides and they'll cancel each other out. Let the glue cure and then joint two sides perfectly straight and square to one another. Then plane the remaining sides parallel to the first two. I'm going to attach the rear fence to the sled with carriage bolts. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm going to make each bolt hole oversized, about one quarter of an inch or six millimeters. That will give me about one degree of movement so that I can adjust the rear fence perfectly square to the blade. Drill and counterbore the base to hold the heads of the bolts. Use the shank holes as a template to mark the location of the bolts on the fence. 
If you have a set of transfer punches, use them to locate the holes precisely. Then drill oversized holes in the fence. Also cut narrow slots in the back side of the fence. Later on, we'll use this to mount some plastic guards. If you want, also cut a groove in the face of the fence to hold a T-track. This isn't absolutely necessary, but as you will see in just a few minutes, it will create some exciting new possibilities. I also suggest that you drill a bolt hole in the fixed fence and a matching counterbore in the base. Now this bolt hole can be the same diameter as a bolt. You won't need it to adjust anything, but you will need it to hold the far end of a saw guard. Glue the fixed fence to the sled base. Also glue two plastic shields that will form the saw guards in the fence slots with an epoxy. Let the adhesives cure overnight, then lightly sand the wood surfaces and apply a protective finish. I'm using a wipe-on poly. When the finish is dry, assemble the parts. If you've cut a groove in the adjustable fence, install the T-track. Then, bolt the fence to the assembly. Now, as mentioned before, the accumulation of sawdust between the fence and the work can afflict the accuracy of your operations. Fortunately, we have a solution. Mount the adjustable fence on fender washers, two per bolt. This creates a small gap under the fence and gives the sawdust some place to hide when you have a board to cut. That doesn't mean that you don't have to keep the sled clean as you work. It just means that you don't have to keep it as clean. Also, bolt the top guard in place. You know, you can make this stuff out of ordinary clear plastic. I'm just using this orange stuff because it looks so good on video. For the time being, square the adjustable fence to the edge of the base and snug the bolts down tight, but not too tight. We'll make the fence even squarer in a moment. Let's get the adjustable fence dialed in. I'm going to use an old method that was invented to square miter gauges. And for this, you need to rip a scrap of wood three to four inches wide. That's 75 to 100 millimeters. Make sure that both edges are perfectly parallel. Draw an X on the board and saw it in two using the sled to cut through the X. Place both pieces against the fence so that the halves of the X meet. Turn one piece edge for edge. Press the ends together and the edges against the fence. Inspect the joint where they meet. If there is a gap near one edge, the fence is not square. Loosen the nuts that hold it down. If the gap is close to the fence, the fence is cocked left and needs to be turned clockwise. If the gap is on the edge away from the fence, the fence is caulked a little to the right. Turn it counterclockwise. When there is no gap, you're home free. Tighten the bolts and pat yourself on the back. Let's see what we can do with this sucker. One of the best features of a double-sided sled is that you can use the kerf in the fence to line up a board for cutting. Just slide the board sideways until the cut mark lines up with the kerf. However, this only works for a short time. The run out in the saw blade soon wallows out the kerf and by the tenth cut, you're taking your life in your hands if you use it to position a board. Instead, cut yourself some disposable fence faces from six millimeter, that's one quarter inch, plywood. Clamp a disposable face to the fence and cut a kerf. Use that kerf until you can no longer trust it then turn the face over and cut another. Use that face up and turn it again, or slide it sideways. You can keep going with this for as long as you can convince yourself that you don't have time to make a new disposable fence. I've used some of these things long enough to become emotionally attached. This is going in my scrapbook. Another great feature is that you can dispense with stop blocks. This is where you use your fence as a stop to make repetitive cuts. It's dangerous to use the fence alone because if the cutoff gets wedged between the fence and the blade, the blade will throw it at you. To keep everyone happy, you attach a stop block to your fence and register the cut off the block. That way, even if the cutoff gets cocked, it won't get wedged and it won't kick back. With a double-sided sled, the cutoff never gets cocked as long as you hold it securely against the fence. Just make sure that you don't release the cutoff 
until you slide the sled back to the starting point and the cutoff is clear of the blade. Unfortunately, this only works for cutoffs that are eight inches long and longer. You can't get the fence any closer to the blade than that. It's blocked by the sled. So for those shorter cutoffs, it's a good idea to have a stop that you can attach to the sled itself. The stop mounts in the T-track that we installed in the fence. Note that it's reversible. You can use it on either side of the blade. And it's micro-adjustable. I'm using a number 10 32-pitch machine screw to do the adjusting. One full turn moves the head of the screw one thirty-second of an inch. If you think in meters, use an M3 screw. One full turn will move the head 0.5 millimeters. This is a tenoning jig. Well, rather, it's a tenoning jig when it's attached to the sled. You can, in fact, attach all sorts of jigs to the sled. And you aren't confined to using the T-Track. Remember that the rear fence is bolted to the base. You can easily remove it and use the bolt holes to hold a very substantial jig or fixture in its place. It's this feature that makes this sled so incredibly versatile and capable. It's not just for crosscuts anymore. The plans for this double-sided crosscut sled are available from the Workshop Companion General Store. And we've thrown in the plans for the tenoning attachment and the stop. And even if you don't need a sled, there are plenty of other jigs, projects, and books for you to consider. Remember, like, subscribe, and buy to keep our saws sawing and our cameras rolling. And once again, thank you for your kind attention.